Hello and welcome back to the course on machine learning. Today we're talking about the intuition behind the a priori algorithm. So let's get started. And we're going to get started by talking about a story. It's a somewhat legend of data science or a legend that is uh, quite well known in data science. And you may have heard of uh, this uh, legend. It's not a myth. It actually happened. But um, as you know, things when they happen a long time ago and then time passes, and the facts get distorted. But I'll tell you my story of this legend, and uh, it might not be exactly correct, but this is how I uh, know about it and how I've heard about it. So what do you think the commonality is between these two products? Uh, pampers or diapers and beer. What do you think they have in common? And why are they part of this uh, ur <laughs> urban legend? Now, why are they part of this data science legend? Well, as the story goes, um, a company, we're not going to name the company, uh, but a company that is actually, actually like a uh, convenience store um, did some analytics around the uh, products that people are purchasing. And so they were looking at uh, you know, what people are checking out with, what are the commonalities, and they analyzed thousands and thousands and thousands of uh, transactions. So thousands of people who actually checked out, if not tens of thousands. And um, they found a very interesting thing that uh, very often during certain times of the day when people shop in the afternoon uh, between like 6 and uh, 9 p.m., uh, people who buy um, diapers also buy beer. And it was like out of the blue, completely out of the blue. Uh, like how, why these two products are completely not connected, right? Uh, why would somebody buy uh, beer when they're buying diapers or why buy diapers when they're buying beer, right? So uh, that was the fact that they came across in the data. And uh, the explanation to this fact, one of the plausible explanations is that uh, in the afternoons or in the evenings when um, the husband gets home, um, and they're ta like him, uh, the husband and the wife are taking care of the, their baby. Uh, they sometimes find that they run out of diapers. And who has to go pick up the diapers? Well, the husband has to go pick up the diapers, right? Or the wife sends the husband to go pick up the diapers. And while he's picking up the diapers, because it's already after hours after work, he also, he's already in the convenience store, he also picks up some beer, right? And so that is a plausible explanation. Might be the case, might not be the case, but it sounds pretty reasonable. And uh, based on that, so that's something that you can't really think of just by yourself, but that comes from the data, right? And based on that, you can decide how to arrange products in your store, right? So some stores might decide to put the, these two products closer to entice people to buy a beer when they're buying diapers. But actually, a lot of stores do the opposite. There are a lot of stores uh, separate uh, beer and diapers, Right, just like they try to separate, and you'll probably notice this from your convenience store that they try to separate uh, bread and milk as far as possible. Why? Because that way, they already know that these two products are bought together, and so you actually have to walk through the whole store to pick up. You know, you've picked up your bread, and then to get to the milk, you have to get all the way through the whole store to the completely opposite corner of the store. So as you're walking through the store, you see more other products and you're more likely to pick up an additional item that you weren't actually planning on buying when you got to the store in the first place. So there's a lot of interesting marketing tactics that are used based on this data, but the question is, how do you get to this data? And one of the ways to get to it is the a priori algorithm. So let's talk about a priori in a bit more detail now. All right, so uh, a priori is about people who bought something also bought something else, uh, or who watched something also watched something else, or who did something also did something else. So uh, it analyzes, and this whole association uh, rule learning uh, part of the course is all about analyzing when things uh, come in pairs or in triplicates or in, in, in se like not in sequence, but they are combined together for some reason, lo looking for those uh, rules and those ways that this happens. All right, so let's have a look. Um, for instance, movie recommendation, right? So you've got your user IDs, you've got movies that the people liked, movie one, two, three, four, movie one and two for the second person and so on. And from here, just by looking at it, even without not knowing anything about 
association rule learning or a priori al- the a priori algorithm, you can already tell that uh, there are some potential rules that can come out of this. That, for instance, everybody who watches movie one, not everybody, but it is likely that people who watch movie one will or who like movie one will also like movie number two. And people who like movie number two are quite likely to also like movie number four. And people who like, like num- movie number one are also quite likely to like movie number three. So there you can you can come up with lots of different potential rules, but some are going to be stronger, some are going to be weaker. And we want to find the very strong ones in order to build our business decisions or our other decisions um, on those rules that we can see in the data, right? We don't have to go and ask people hey, do you like movie number one and would you like movie number two? Because of that, do you like movie number two or what is your taste and preference? We can see these things from the data and we want to extract this information. And as long as our, you know, we have a large enough sample size, you know, if it's not just like five people, if it's 50,000 or uh, 500,000 people that we're analyzing, we can come up with quite some quite solid rules. All right, so uh, here's... Another example where we've got a market basket. So, uh, example of uh, people who uh, buy uh, grocery, not just groceries, but this is more kind of like a, a restaurant or a uh, takeaway place. And here you can see there's a link, obviously, between burgers and French fries, interesting vegetables and fruits, and people are trying to be healthy, burgers, French fries, and ketchup. So, again, these are potential rules, not necessarily the ones that we're going to take away from data. This is just an example of something that you might observe. Uh, visually just by looking at this data set. All right, so uh, how does the a priori algorithm work? Well, the a priori algorithm has three parts to it. It has got the support, the confidence, and the lift. So we're going to start off with the support. Um, and you will see that it's it's very similar to something we've already discussed. It's very similar to uh, the way we talked about the intuition for the Bayesian, uh, for uh, the naive Bayes um classifiers. So let's have a look here. We've got movie recommendations. Support for movie M is uh, the number is defined as the number of users uh, who watched movie M divided by the total number of users, right? And market basket optimization, same thing, uh, number of transactions containing certain item, I, divided by the total number of transactions. Let's uh, have a look at an illustration. Here we've got 100 people, so we've got uh, five rows and 20 columns of human beings. <laughs> um, and uh, let's see how many of them, uh, let's say we're talking about a movie, and I'm going to uh, give an example of one of my favorite movies, Ex Machina, and if you haven't seen it, definitely check it out. It's all about AI and machine learning. So let's say, let's see how many of these people have actually seen Ex Machina. So there we go. There's... 10 people who have seen X Machina, right, out of 100. So what does that mean? That means our support here is 10%. Good. Okay. Now let's move on to step two. Step two is we need to find the confidence. What is the confidence? Well, confidence is uh, defined as the number, let's go for movies. So the number of uh, people who have seen uh, movies M1 and M2 divided by the number of people have seen a uh, movie M1. So here we're going to assume that we, we're testing a rule. We're testing a rule that, uh, let's say, people who have seen Interstellar, right? We're, we have a hypothesis that uh, says that people who have seen Interstellar, they are also or have uh, liked Interstellar, are also... Uh, likely to like uh, Max Machine, or let's let's even go with seen. People who have seen Interstellar are also likely to have seen uh, X Machina. So basically here, movie number one, M1, is going to be um, uh, the Interstellar movie. Uh, the one that we're saying, okay, so we're gonna take everybody who's seen Interstellar and we're gonna check how many of them have seen X Machina. And that's exactly what we're doing here. And market basket optimization, same thing. You can think of an example of French fries and burgers, for instance. People have had burgers, who have ordered burgers, also likely to order French fries. So uh, at the top, you'd have people who have ordered burgers and French fries. And the P at the bottom, you'd have people who have ordered burgers only, uh, who have ordered burgers, regardless of whether they've ordered French fries or not. Uh, much easier to talk about this with an illustration. Uh, let's say those gre- people on, <laughs> colored in green are the ones who have seen Interstellar, right? Who have um, watched this movie. 
Now we want to know, not out of a whole population, but out of just those people who have seen Interstellar, how many of them have seen Ex Machina. So out of them, we have seven people who have also seen Ex Machina. So there's only seven people who have seen both movies. That's what we're after. And so our confidence is going to be seven divided by 40. Just by definition, this is how it's calculated. Uh, 40 people have seen uh, Interstellar and seven people out of those 40 have actually also seen Ex Machina. So uh, the confidence here is 17.5%. Good. And the next part or the third and last step is the lift. And what is the lift? Lift is very simple. Again, it's going to be very similar to uh, what we had in the naive Bayes, uh, uh, naive Bayesian classifiers. Um, in that algorithm when we were discussing it, so conf the lift is basically the confidence divided by the support. Um, so what we calculated in step two divided by what we calculated in step one. And let's just t talk about it in the illustration because it's going to make way more sense that way. Um, so here's our population. Those people in green are the ones who have seen Interstellar. And all of these people in red are the ones who have seen Ex Machina. So basically our lift is, all right, so if we just randomly, right, randomly suggest to a person to watch Ex Machina, right? Uh, what is the likelihood that they will, um, you know, that it's a movie for them. It's a movie that, not in this population, like out of the, out of this population, we know that out of 100 people, only 10 actually watch, watch X Machine. And we're going to assume that watched and like are interchangeable terms here. So we're going to assume that if they, if they didn't watch it, they, they're not going to like it anyway. So if we take another random um, uh, population, and then um, what is the likelihood that if we recommend to a random person in that population, that brand new population, uh, we recommend that f uh, the Ex Machina movie, what is the likelihood that they will like it? Well, the likelihood is 10%, um, right? Because we only, out of 100 people, only 10 of them actually liked that movie. But now the question is, can we prove that result by using some prior knowledge? That's why the algorithm is called a priori. Um, can, in that new population, let's only recommend Ex Machina to people who have already seen Interstellar, to people who are marked as green in this population. So we'll only find out, we'll only ask, have you seen Interstellar? If they have, then we'll recommend Ex Machina. What is the likelihood that a person will actually like Ex Machina if we recommend them that way? Well, in that case, the likelihood, as we've calculated, out of the green people, only, uh, not only, <laughs> out of the green people, 17.5% actually liked Ex Machina. So the lift is the improvement in your prediction. So your original prediction, your original prediction is 10%, right? If you just randomly take a person out of your new population and recommend them Ex Machina, they'll like it with a likelihood of 10%. If you first ask the question, have you uh, seen and liked Interstellar? If they say yes, and then you recommend Ex Machina, the likelihood of a successful recommendation there is 17.5%. So the lift is, by definition, 1.75. There we go. That is what uh, the lift is defined as. And uh, uh, that's pretty much the whole a priori algorithm. That's the steps that it involves. And now we're just going to put it all together uh, in, in this one kind of... Um, step-by-step uh, -step process. So step one, uh, you need to set up a minimum support and confidence, right? So you might want to only, uh, because there's so many different recommendations, right? We only looked at uh, one example, uh, one specific example to simplify things. We talked about uh, X uh, Machina and um, Interstellar. But as you could see in the examples before that, you could have like a hundred different movies and the different combinations, like a priori is actually quite a slow algorithm because it just goes through uh, all of these different algorithms or all of these different combinations. So it says, what if movie one is a good uh, recommendation for movie two? or movie one means a person will like movie two, movie one means a person will like movie three, and movie one, movie four, and then it actually combines more. It says movie one and movie two might mean that person will like movie three, and so on. So it actually combines lots and lots and lots of not just pairs, not triplets. Uh, like it uh, combines four, five, six, seven items in one in one set, and so on. And um, yeah, so it, it gets quite big, and therefore you need to set some kind of limitations. Um, so you need to set a minimum support. For instance, you might not want to uh, look at products that are that have a support of 
less than 20%. You might not even want to consider them because you don't want to waste your time uh, building a model for something that is only has a uh, success rate of 20% on its own, right? So, or you might limit it at 5%. Um, then you, you might want to also limit a confidence. So, in our example, the confidence was 17.5%, right? Uh, that uh, somebody who somebody who liked one movie will like the other one. Maybe you might want to limit it at, uh, you know, anything less than 12%. You don't want to look at it because it's not a strong enough um, factor for you. It's not a strong enough rule for you because there is going to be so many different rules on the output of this algorithm. Uh, you already know that you'll have much stronger ones, so you don't want to consider anything that's less than 12% or 20% or uh, whatever percentage you decide to set for your, uh, in that specific scenario. Uh, then once you've set those, then you take all the subsets in uh, transactions having higher support than minimum uh, than the minimum support, take all the rules of the subset having higher confidence than minimum confidence, basically apply those two minimums that you've set. And then at the end, of course, you sort the rules by the decreasing lift. So that's where the lift comes in. The rule with the highest lift, given these criteria, is going to be the strongest rule. And that's the one you might want to look into first, right? Something like, I don't know, if a person buys a burger and french fries, then they're likely to buy uh, tomato sauce or ketchup as well. And because, you know, and that some of the, sometimes it, it makes sense, right? Because you need ketchup to, a lot of people like to eat ketchup with their burgers and french fries. So basically you find the ones with the highest lift and those are the ones in your top 10 or top five. And those are the ones that you consider for actually implementing a business decision um, and basing it on them. So that's pretty much how the a priori algorithm works. Um, it was quite a long story, but I thought we had some some good fun here. There's there's another example that I wanted to share with you. Um, <laughs> oh, okay. So just wanted to mention that recommender systems, like things like uh, companies like Amazon News and others, and Netflix and so on, um, they're th like a good. There would be a they would be a good uh, uh, example for using a priori, a priori would uh, be good there, but of course they are much more sophisticated. They're not just a priori, they actually use combinations or uh, very uh, specific or specifically designed algorithms. So uh, I just don't want you to be confused that a priori, that means that everything uses a priori. A priori is just a, a basic um, kind of um, straightforward approach to, to solving this problem and it's a good example of um, you know how it can be done but of course there are other ways of uh, doing it and for instance um, you know we'll look at the we'll look at some other methods and in fact some of the methods that we already used can be used to build uh, recommender systems as well all right so on that note um, thank you for your attention and off we go to Hadlan to look at how we can code a priori in um, R and Python and I'll see you here next time until then happy analyzing <laughs>